Okay. A bit of a mixed bag of responses here, so I think the, the, uh, we're fairly even in what we think it is, whether it's A, B, or both the same. Um, if you have a think about it, you think about the area that's being covered by this antenna, or this communication system, and the area that's being covered by this one. So B is much smaller than A, which means if the power is the same at that receiver, it's probably likely that the power being transmitted by B is a lot less. Because it's only transmitting over a much smaller area. So it's basically focusing all of the power that it's got. Oops, sorry, I've gone, gone past a few slides. Basically focusing all the power that's being transmitted into a very small area, so it's being a bit more efficient with the power that it's using. Whereas A is trying to give a wider coverage, so it needs more power to be able to cover that area. We're going to look at how we analyze this today, so understand more analytically how we can come to this conclusion. Uh, but hopefully that gives you kind of an intro to what we're looking at today. We're finishing off our communications, our look at communications, um, and focusing on the link budget. I got this right. Yep. Okay, so on Monday we looked at the communication system architecture, the various different structures, so sort of the ground station, the satellite, the link between that, and then the various different ways we could arrange that depending on the orbit type or the, the configuration that we've got. We also looked at how we encode signals. We take an analog signal and we make it digital, how we digitize it, and how we then transmit that. And we started looking at the link budget. So this is how we characterize the performance of our communication system, how we say how well are we taking the power that we've got either on board the satellite and using it to transfer the data to the ground or the other way. So if, if it's usually if it's from the satellite to ground, it's called a downlink. If it's from the ground station up to the satellite, we call it an uplink. And we looked at the uh, signal to noise ratio. So we, we looked at various different sources of noise and how we characterize that. We use the, the noise temperature, um, and then we look at what's the ratio between the signal power and the noise power, and that's a really important factor. So we saw from that, from that graph that I showed you right at the end, as we increase that signal to noise ratio, so as our signal gets stronger in relation to our noise, we start to be able to distinguish our signal much more clearly against the background noise. And that's a really important factor in any communications link, to be able to improve that signal to noise ratio so that we can make sure we pick up and distinguish what the signal is. So are we all happy with that? We move on to look at a little bit more detail about how we go through this process of calculating the link budget. Because what you'll do tomorrow in the tutorial is go through calculating a link budget for, for a particular um, scenario that we'll give you. OK, so um, if we want to characterize the performance of an antenna, so our antenna is there to give us some gain in our signal. Gain means increase, so improve the signal to noise ratio. That's, that's the signal strength. Um, if we have an isotropic radiator, an isotropic antenna, effectively that's what it's doing is radiating the power from the transmitter in all directions equally. Isotropic, that's what it, that's what it means, iso. So ev in every direction, it's like that energy is coming out, that power is coming out um, in a sphere and, and, and uh, propagating through, through the, um, the space. So P is our output power, and gain then is, uh, if it, our gain then is one. So our output power in relation to the power that we're transmitting is equal to one. Okay, and that means we looked at last, uh, or last time about how we um, kind of what the, the mathematics that we use to analyze uh, communication systems. So we're looking using the decibel. So if we get, take the log of one, what do we get? Yep. Yep. So that's zero decibels. Okay. So if we have a gain of one, that means we ha in in power ratio, it means in decibels we have a gain of zero dB. 
Okay, so that so effectively we're not adding anything, any power. Um, we're not focusing our, our beam in any way. We're not trying to um, increase the power of the beam, the effective power of the beam. We're, we're just transmitting that power equally in every direction. If we have a high gain antenna, what we end up doing is we're squashing all of that power. So we think, imagine if you take that sphere. Um, so just imagine it as a circle for now on. because it, it is a sphere, so it's three-dimensional but it's easier to kind of visualize if you think of it as just a circle and then we squash it all in a particular direction. We get a sort of pattern like this. So you've got your main beam here. Okay, and you can see all of the power is most, mostly focused in there. You're going to get these funny little side lobes, okay? That's just a natural feature of the, the sort of way it happens, the antenna design, what happens. You get these, these little lobes that are popping out. So they're, they're kind of to do with the harmonics and to do with the geometry of it all. So you don't need to know the, the kind of finer detail about that. What you need to understand is that you're effectively taking that power that's uniformly kind of propagating and you're trying to just focus it in a particular direction. And by doing that, you're increasing the, the power that's just coming in this direction and you're not transmitting anywhere else. So if your satellite's there or your ground station's there, then you've got a much better stronger link between it, but if it's over here, then you can't communicate with it. So there's a downside with that as well. So it means that your coverage is much more reduced, but you need less power to transmit the same signal. So, not much the main one. Yeah, so there are these little side lobes. So you may be able to pick up some signal, but the majority of the signal is coming through this main beam. Okay? And that's where you would have your satellite or link. And the between. Of HDA, is the point comparison can reduce any Yeah, so if you're slightly off what we call bore sight, which is the kind of main direction of that beam, then you're obviously going to be quite down in power levels. So it's very important to be able to point accurately if you've got a very high gain antenna. But it confers this advantage that we don't need as much power to maintain that high signal to noise ratio. You got any other questions around that? We're kind of fairly happy. So remember this is a two-dimensional representation of what's happening in three dimensions. So, so if you look at what they look like, the kind of uh, the isotropic radiator is a sphere and that one is, is a kind of um, cone-like shape with these funny little side lobes. Okay, so we can then define um, our effective isotropic radiated power over our power ratio as our gain. Okay, our gain is how much we're increasing our what our actual power is in relation to um, what we was perceived to get at the this receiver. Does that make sense? Yeah? You happy with that? Okay, so for a transmitter with an output power, PT, then the gain is going to be um, GT. So we have an effective isotropic radiated power, which is PT by GT. So if we can increase the gain, that means that we increase this effective power at our receiver and that improves our signal to noise. So in general for, a, for an antenna, um, and this is, is a, a sort of, don't, don't worry about the derivation of this, but it, it's, a, it's, it's to explain the geometry in relation to, so how, how we take the antenna geometry and, and relate it to gain. So for, for a general antenna, we have four pi over area of effective divided by lambda squared. So lambda is the uh, wavelength of the, of the um, frequency of the radio waves that we're using. You can see the gain is related to that frequency. So that's a very important factor that we need to consider. We looked um, on Monday at the various different frequency bands that are allocated by the International Telecommunications Unit to different activities. Um, and so that will be an important factor in looking at the performance of a communication system and the performance of an antenna. So for a circular parabolic antenna, the gain is given by something up, some term for the efficiency of the antenna times 
uh, pi d over lambda squared. Okay, so that's just we've taken the area for that, that circular area disk and we've incorporated it into this gain equation. So we get a kind of simple relationship for a parabolic antenna. Okay, we don't expect you to memorize these relationships if you need them in an equation, in, in an exam, they, they would be given to you. But just to give you an idea of how we start to, to calculate that and what the factors that are affecting that gain. So obviously if you've got a bigger dish, you're gonna have more gain, okay? So that's not gonna improve. But a bigger dish, you've got to accommodate that on your satellite. So you've got to then um, have a, a mass penalty. So there's, there's a trade-off there. And then the frequency is also a factor. So how, how that, that wavelength or the frequency of the, the transmitting signal influences that gain. We've got any questions around that? No? I'm very happy. Okay. So how we characterize then the beam width how we define it, is usually um, at the point of half power, we define what the angle is, okay? So we can work out what the half power is, um, and what is log of two? Can we log, two? yeah, when we log two, what do we get? With base what? Base 10. Anyone quick off the draw? Okay, so, so log 2 is about 0.3, so 10 log 2 is about 3. This is where we get 3 decibels. So 3 decibels is about the half power. Okay, so if we, if we start here, where we've got maximum power, and we're obviously propagating our signal, so it's starting to, re as, it, as it's getting wider in that beam, it's reducing its power, its kind of measured power at that at each point. Um, and so at 3 dB, that is where we measure the angle give us a kind of characterization of that. Because you can see the angle is slightly changing. It's not a fixed cone. It, it's, it's slightly um, curved. So to be able to just characterize that. Is everyone happy with that? No? OK, so um, empirically, we can then define the, um, cone, the, the sort of beam angle for a circular parabolic antenna as 70 divided over lambda divided by d degrees, okay? So where lambda, again, is that operating wavelength, and d is our dish diameter. That helps us characterize um, what the width is. And why, why do we think, why are we interested in the beam width? What's that going to give us? Yep? Our tolerance, so, so to avoid any problems involving pointing errors? Okay, so it will, it will tell us how more sensitive we probably are to, to pointing errors. If we've got very narrow beam width, we're going to be very sensitive. But, but what is our beam width ultimately telling us about, about our transmission? What, if we had a beam width of 15 degrees as opposed to a beam width of um, 45 degrees, how much area, if I was talking just like this to these people like that, and I have a beam width of 15 degrees, who am I talking to? in the room. Just a few of you here, but if I have a beam width like this, I'm talking to the whole room, so my coverage is increased. So the beam width is telling us a little bit about our coverage. So it's an, that's why it's an important factor, to be able to understand what the area is that we're actually covering. Okay, so, so if we look at this again, um, so that's that diagram again I showed you at the beginning. Uh, both of these transmitters, have the same EIRP, effective irradiated um, uh, power, okay? So that, what that means is at this <coughs> receive antenna, the power I'm receiving is the same, okay? So I, I can't distinguish between the signal to noise on either of those. The power that I'm getting there from, from that transmitter, it, it seems the same. But this transmitter, requires 20 watts of power because the gain is only five. Whereas this transmitter only one requires 0.8 of a watt of power because the gain is 125. 
So I've, I've managed to reduce the power on my tra for my tra transmitter, so that might be on your satellites, and that's a really important factor to be able to reduce that power on your satellite. Because if you can reduce the power, what does that mean for other, other systems on the satellite? They might have more power. Okay? If you've got a fixed power supply, you can divert that power elsewhere, or you can reduce the mass of the power system, so you can have a much smaller satellite. So it has a big impact on the overall satellite design. But what I've lost is that I'm now only covering a very small area. So I'm only talking to the middle band of, of this room rather than the whole room. So that's going to have an influence on what your mission is. So if I was a communication satellite and I needed to talk to everybody, would it be better to be A or B? A, yeah. I want to be able to have a wider. So I, communication satellites tend to be very high power because they're, uh, they're rain, they're, um, what, what they're transmitting over the, the, the range of the, the, the area sorry, that they're transmitting over is much wider. So that cover it area needs to be larger. Um, if I'm sort of just doing some scientific measurements and I'm only going to talk to a particular ground station, and I know I'm only going to talk to that particular ground station at particular times, then I could have a really high gain antenna and have a very low power signal. So I could be really far away as well and still only require a very small amount of power. So it's, that's just an important thing to think about the mission and why you need that. So one is, is a high power, low gain, which is this configuration, and the other is a low power high gain. So that's what we mean when we're saying gain. And that's what, if you can keep that in your head, when you, when you think about gain, what is happening to that um, signal. So the first illuminates a large coverage area, and the second, it only has a coverage area of about 125th of the first, or 20, but it only uses 25th of the power. So that's a big advantage there. So as I said, the choice depends on the mission. So have you got any questions about that or anything? Fairly happy with that? Excellent. Okay. So now, this is, a, again, a bit more empirical. These are typical designs of antennas that you might see on board satellites and how we can measure the performance from the ways we characterize based on their geometry. Okay? So not, not perfect. You would need to generally stick these in, in, sort of in a system to be able to actually measure the, um, the actual performance. Um, and that's where you get the efficiencies from generally. Okay, so someone asked a question about that on Piazza, where we get these efficiencies. Um, we've given you, in, the, in the, the notes, some typical examples of efficiencies for these typical geometries. Okay? For, if you want to look in detail, you'd have to go to an antenna manufacturer, and they've done some analysis on their antenna, and they've identified what the efficiency of that antenna is. Okay? You're not, you're not going to be able to just work it out completely from the geometry. Okay? It's, it's a more complex thing that is an analytical solution um, working out from the geometry, but we know from past performance what typical geometries, what sort of efficiencies they will give. Okay? So we've got these very simple antenna designs, these horn antennas, so either a square horn or a circular horn, and defined by some sort of geometry, and we can see what they're. So um, I've written this in terms of DBI. So DBI is again our decibel, but our decibel in relation to an isotropic radiator. Okay, so that isotropic was the antenna that would transmit evenly in every direction. And remember, our dBs are always these ratios. Yeah, so we had dB watt um, in the in last on Monday. So that was the power in relation to one watt. Well, we just have dB where we're relating two power ratios. We've got a power ratio. Okay, so. Um, this one is just in relation to a isotropic radiator. We've got a helix type antenna. You can see the efficiency is a little bit bigger, a little bit higher. It's a much more complex geometry. Okay, so, so you really have to warrant the need for a higher efficiency to be able to incorporate a sort of um, this type of, of system. And then you've got various parabolic reflectors, um, either a front fed, so you've got 
your signal being fed in here and it's being reflected um, through, or your signal is offset and it's being reflected, <coughs> or we, what we call Cassegrain, uh, which comes from um, the optical telescope world as well, where you've got a hole in your antenna and, and, or in your dish and it, your signal is coming in from there and it's being reflected through there. And that just all of these just depend on the configuration of your satellite, what your needs are in terms of the overall design you might look at. But ver various kind of efficiencies, but we can define empirically the, these efficiencies or the gain, and, and we can identify the efficiencies by, by looking at the performance. So we got any questions? Yeah, we got questions. What would be smart to um, it depends on the frequency. So you could, like, the efficiency is a, is a factor of frequency. Um, it depends on the, um, the gain that you need as well. So I think if you look at some, um, is it YMAP that was looking at uh, the radio waves that were left after the Big Bang, so it's a, a sensor. It uses a lot of these little horn antennas. It's very sensitive um, because. It, it's just part of the geometry, but also part of the sensitivity in the array. I, it's, um, it's a bit of a, a, a dark art antenna design, but it, it just depends on sort of mo mostly the, the frequency that you're considering and then what the performance is that you need in order to do that. Any other questions? Oh, okay. Uh, so another way we can measure our link quality is what we call our bit error rate. So if you remember on Monday we were looking at, um, we don't transmit analog signals, we tend to transmit digitized signals. And digitized signals come in bits and bytes, okay? So we need to understand what error we might get in our <coughs> signal, um, to, what's the probability of getting a bit error uh, for a particular, what we've got here is, um, our signal to noise in the energy per bit over noise ratio. Okay, so we've converted that um, uh, signal to noise into called quantized bits, and that's the energy per bit uh, over per noise. And this is often given the bit error ratio is often given as a customer requirement because obviously the customer doesn't want to have lots of errors in their data, lots of errors in, in what they're what you're transmitting, and they have a certain requirement in order to be able to perform their mission, perform the function. Um, and it depends then on the choice of the different types of modulation schemes. So we looked at frequency shift keying or phase shift keying um, and amplitude shift keying and, and what those meant in terms of how we actually generate the ones and zeros to, to, to make this data um, digital. And these, there are different ways of doing that. So. Um, Q is, I think, quadrature, um, I think B is binary, I'm not sure, but there are various different methods we can do to do either phase shift keying um, or frequency shift keying or amplitude. Uh, you see here, amplitude doesn't feature on this table or on this graph because it's generally quite low performance, okay? So we generally focus on either phase shift keying or frequency shift keying. We get a lot, lot better performance, um, a lot better signal uh, to noise ratio out of those, those sort of schemes. So our carrier to noise density ratio, our signal to noise ratio um, was C over N. So C was a power in our, our, um, transmitted, free, um, our transmitted power and um, our signal power strength. And N is our noise. And if we uh, divide that through by the duration of the bit, okay, the, Bit, um, or the bit rate, RB, multiplied by the bit rate, then we get this EB over NO. Okay? So we can convert that signal to noise ratio to an energy per bit noise ratio. And we can look at then this graph and see what's a good, if, if we have a particular probability of bit error that we need for our signal, what's a good modulation scheme to use to, to generate that digital signal? Does that make sense? Sort of. I lost you a little bit. Yeah. What's MSK? Um, I can't remember the acronyms there, <coughs> but I think it's somebody. It might be somebody's name, but it's something shift keying anyway. I'll I'll leave that to you to look up. Um, but 
Remember we had the three types. We had amplitude shift keying, phase shift keying, and uh, frequency shift keying. So frequency was where we were changing the frequency to represent zero, and a different frequency to represent one. Um, amplitude shift keying was where we had a high amplitude to represent one, and we had a low amplitude to represent zero. So we're changing the amplitude of the signal. And phase is where we're changing the phase, so we're offsetting the phase, one to represent one and one to represent zero. And that gives us our train of ones and zeros, which we've digitized our data. Yeah? What is EB and So e, EB is the energy per bit to the noise ratio. So I'm, I'm converting, because we've got our signal to noise ratio, where the signal was effectively um, all of those bits together in the string. And now I'm trying to divide it down into each bit and see what the energy per bit is to noise ratio, because then we can look at how susceptible that um, transmission, that digitization is to generating errors. So this is for different energy per bit. This is the sort of probability of the, that the error that you'll get. So obviously, if you've got a high probability, you're going to get lots of errors in your data. Yes, yeah, so you're more likely to get errors if your probability is high. If you've got uh, lower and lower probabilities down here, you're getting less and less errors, but you need a higher signal to noise or energy per bit to noise ratio. So e, EB over N is just the equivalent <laughs> signal to noise, but for a digitized signal for that digital bit. Okay, any other question? No? Okay. Okay, so then we go on to what the losses are. So we've looked at the gain which is our antenna, what are our losses? So we, can, we looked at this briefly on Monday, what the different losses, so our losses is, is if we've got this transmitter here, it's in red because it's hot, it's transmitting, and we transmit this signal over a wide path length, a little distance, as, as it gets further and further away, the, the signal is getting weaker and weaker because it's being spread over a wider and wider area. Even if we focus that with our antenna, it's still being spread over a wider area as it gets further away. We've got some sort of beam, beam width or um, angle. Our signal is also going through the atmosphere. So the atmosphere absorbs energy from radio waves. It dissipates uh, the radio waves, so it has some influence of that. It interacts with that. The biggest one is our microwaves. So think about how a microwave oven works. It basically puts energy into water molecules. So water molecules absorb energy from microwaves. If you're transmitting by microwaves, any water molecules in the way are going to absorb that energy. If you absorb some of that energy, you reduce the power that's actually going to get to your transmitter. Just thinking about tangible, what you know about um, sort of microwaves and what transmission already just from your own experiences. And then we've got internal circuit losses. So these are to do with if you um, have a current flowing in a wire, it's going to heat up that wire. So all of you might have experienced that when you, when you touch your um, uh, charger for your phone, you, or you can feel the phone quite warm. OK, that's just a current flowing through the charger, giving you ohmic resistance, which heats something up. That's how a kettle works. OK, but that's a loss. We don't really want that heat. Okay, it's not really part of the adv advantage for the system, and it, it constitutes as a loss. And then we've got losses, we talked about before, losses due to pointing. So if we've got this very high gain antenna that's pointing very directional, and we're slightly off, we're going to be losing a lot of that power. We're not going to be right down our main power, our bore site. We're going to be slightly off from that. So we're losing some of the main power that we need. Any questions around those? No. Okay. And then any other losses. So these might be just other things um, between connectors within the system or things that we haven't quite thought of and things in the system that are causing other losses. We just lump them all together as additional losses when we're doing our analysis. Okay. If you're, if you're doing a more in-depth analysis, you might try and identify what, what those sources are to be able to either remove them or mitigate them. <coughs> So free space loss, this one we can kind of 
do a bit of analysis and work out analytically how to determine this. So this is, as our beam is, is propagating through, how does it reduce? So as the important factors here are our range. So here's our transmitter, here's our receiver. So transmitter could be on the ground and our receiver could be in space or equally vice versa. And we've got some sort of distance between them, characterized by S. Okay, so as we get further away from T, then this, this, is, this signal is being um, transmitted over a wider area. And the power flux um, is P times, so power times gain divided by four pi S squared. So that, that sphere, the drama, that spherical geometry. And the received power is then the, that power flux times whatever your effective area of your receive antenna is. So in, the, in this case, our effective area is going to be lambda squared times the gain of the antenna divided by 4 pi. This is how we defined it earlier on. Yeah. And so we can get our received power as a function of these various parameters. Lambda, remember, is that the wavelength of our transmitted um, signal, so that frequency is important, okay? And then the distance between our transmitter and our receiver, that's an important factor. Um, and then our, our transmitted power, our gain from our transmitter, and our gain from our receiver, okay? And this is then, so if we simplify this, the received power is power, the, the power transmitted, the gain from the transmitter, the gain from the receiver, divided by this thing, this term called free space loss. Okay, so we've just pulled all these other terms together from this propagation to, to um, quantify them as what we call free space loss. So we can define this term free space loss as four pi s over lambda all squared. And this is characterized, and you can see what, what it's effectively saying is that as you get further away, you're going to get a bigger and bigger loss in your signal. So you're closer to your transmitter, you're going to have much higher signal strength, but as you get further and further away, that's going to get bigger and bigger. Any questions around that before we move on? Um, you mean at the frequency? So, so it's, you've got some Doppler sort of effects. So, so that would be also, um, it might not necessarily constitute a loss, or it could do, but it, you'd have to um, have a have system on board to be able to uh, change the frequency to accommodate for that Doppler shift, to be able to distinguish what the signal was. Um, but you, it, that could then result in losses in your system as well, if you're not able to fully um, reconstitute that, that signal, get that frequency back. Okay, any other questions? Or? Okay, so um, other things we need to think about are atmosphere and rain. So as I say, microwave frequencies absorb uh, by water in the atmosphere. So you can see um, the attenuation, the reduction in our signal per kilometer through our atmosphere. Uh, there's big ones at oxygen, big ones with water, okay, so for different frequencies, gigahertz, okay. So we can look at these maps and see which frequencies are more kind of attenuated and more reduced in our atmosphere. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. And we can divide through um, by our uh, elevation angle, so sine E min, our elevation angle, <coughs> for cases where we're not pointing directly through the atmosphere. So the shortest path would be if we're in, in zenith, we're pointing directly up. As we start going and having some sort of um, elevation angle, so we're pointing through the atmosphere, it's a longer path through the atmosphere, that's going to get worse, that effect through our atmosphere. <coughs> we can see the worst is for sort of uh, 50 gigahertz um, above um, due to and above due to kind of O2, that's the um, oxygen in our atmosphere. Rain clouds have also a big effect, okay, so we're going to have more water vapor, more water present within rain clouds than, than we do generally just have uh, naturally in the atmosphere. Oop. 
Right. So we can, we can see our atmosphere is, is a big attenuator. If, we could, if we're transmitting outside our atmosphere, so from that's why satellite links above the atmosphere are quite good, because we're not losing signal strength by transmitting through the atmosphere. But ultimately, if we want to transmit something to ground, we've got to go through the atmosphere. Can't avoid it. Okay, but we could have a satellite network that's not necessarily transmitting through the atmosphere, transmitting above the atmosphere, and then back down to ground at some other point. Any questions around that? No? Okay. What I want to do in the last little bit is pull all of this together to work out how do we kind of estimate what um, our kind of link budget is. How do we start calculating that? Okay. So we can simplify what we call our link budget, um, and we can say it kind of in, in verbal terms. So if we say um, our received power is effectively equal to our transmitted power plus any gains we have minus any losses we have. Okay? So what we get at our receiver is equal to what we're transmitting from our transmitter plus how we condition that signal to get some gain out of it. So that would be our antenna, potentially. And any losses, we have to take that away because anything that's kind of reducing the signal strength. Mathematically, we write this as our signal to noise ratio. So that's our ratio of a signal to noise is our power transmitted times our transmitter gain times our receiver gain. So those are all the gains. And then our divided by our free space loss, our additional losses, and our noise. So remember, we characterize noise in the system by this noise temperature. And remember, we're doing this logarithmically. Okay, so if we log that, then we've got, well, what happens when we log a divide? Yeah? If you log a divide, and then, you, and then when you remove the, you can separate the logs up into a subtraction of two logs. Mm -hmm. So everything below, so everything in the denominator is negative, everything in the, in the numerator is our positives, our gains. Okay, so we're, su we're subtracting the denominator when we log it from the numerator. Okay, but we can write this out sort of mathematically like this. And then if we start to look, do some sort of dimensional analysis, look, look what the dimensions are of these things. So our signal is measured in, in watts. Remember our noise temperature or our noise was measured in watts uh, per hertz. Okay because that was to do with the bandwidth. So our, our, our NO, so noise, was KT times the bandwidth. Okay, that's Boltzmann constant, the temperature, times that bandwidth. Our NO, we divide it through by the bandwidth. Okay, so then we have that, um, we have it in terms of watts per hertz. Our power is in watts. Our gains, our ratios, so they're unitless, dimensionless. Um, then we've got our free space loss and our additional loss um, and our Boltzmann constant. Again, these losses are, are unitless. Our Boltzmann constant um, is joules per Kelvin and the temperature is in Kelvin. Okay, so we do a bit of dimensional analysis. Convert this into kilograms, meters and seconds, okay, just to see what's, what is the fundamental units that we're looking at here. And then we can write that, so we could do a little bit of crossing out some of these uh, uh, units to kind of simplify, and we see we get it in per second per second. So it's hertz, hertz, okay? Just, just, just the, the units that we're using, and it's the, what comes out of the fact that we're looking at it in terms of the bandwidth, um, and that's, that's where it comes, comes in. But we just, just because this is a, a ratio of powers, but it's a ratio of powers to a power per bandwidth. Okay, so that, that's where that per second, per second. And we've gone through and we can see um, it's all dimensionally correct. So the dimensions of this side are equal to dimensions of this side. So we're fine there. Okay? Any questions on that? <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Okay, so we've got this in mathematics. <coughs> and then we convert it to decibels. 
Excuse me. <coughs> All right. Sorry about the cough. Okay, decibels. So I've not done any magic here. I've just started to use decibels. So I'm just, uh, when I get the decibel of that, that's 10 log uh, C over N. And we, we can separate out all of these components. So we've got our effective irradiated power, which we, is basically our transmitted power times our gain. We've got our, um, what we call our receiver gain to noise density ratio. So we call it, it's just separating the components just to make it easier for us to kind of look at individually. We've got our free space loss. Okay, so I've taken that, that squared component there and just added it to the front there, to 20. So remember, in, in, log, in logarithm, if we've got something squared in our log, we can take that out and just multiply by that. Yeah? And then I've got um, additional losses. So then it just decibel that again. So I've just gone through and converted this into decibels. Um, and then separate it out. So I've got my two gains here and my losses here. Just, um, subtracted it. Any questions around that? Yes, no? Okay, happy? Yep. So we can start to do the, an example with this now. Hopefully we kind of understand how, how this equation functions and how we've generated it. So it seems like a really complex equation with lots of bits. We can break it down, we can see all what, what everything means. Okay? Um, so here's an example. A science satellite in low Earth orbit transmits data at a rate of 20 megabits per second to a ground station with a slant range of 1,500 kilometers. Slant range, just that S, that distance, that absolute distance between. So it might not be um, zenith, it might, there might be some inclination or some elevation that that ground station is looking at that satellite with, and we call that the slant range, the actual distance between ground station and the satellite. Using an S-band downlink frequency of 2.12 gigahertz from a parabolic antenna with a beam width of 30 degrees. So we know things about parabolic antennas, how we work out the gain from a parabolic antenna based on the geometry of that antenna. So we've been told what it something about that, we've been told the beam width, so we can work out some things. The ground station has a receiver parabolic dish antenna of five meter diameter. So we can, then we know something about the geometry of the ground station. And the system noise temperature is 135 Kelvin. If the, if the transmitter power is 30 watts, and there is an additional link loss of 6.33 decibels due to pointing errors, and line losses, and other, other atmospheric losses, so this is our configuration as we are. We've got the ground station here, and we've got our slant range, our distance between our ground station and the satellite, 1,500 kilometers. We've got some free space interference or free space loss and some atmospheric interference. Calculate our EB over NO, so our signal to noise in energy per bit, so the digital signal to noise for the transmission in decibels. So you can be asked to do this. Determine modulation method with minimum losses for the required bit error rate of 5 times 10 to the minus 7. So we've been asked by our customer, what's a, well, I want a bit error rate of this. What is the best modulation method to use to get this? What's the minimum losses I'll have? And calculate the link margin in decibels. What we mean by link margin is that the, the, the difference between what we actually need to give us a, a good signal to noise and what we're actually giving, what our signal is actually giving us. So if, I, if we have a positive, a high link margin, that means that even if we haven't accounted for some losses, we've still got a margin within our transmission signal to be able to accommodate those. So we can still have some more losses in the system and we, will, we won't lose our signal to noise, our, sig our signal strength. So I'm going to go through quickly how we do this. So we're breaking it down, okay, into all the bits from that link budget equation that, that we've just gone through. So if we go back, so I'm basically just going to apply this equation and work out each bit, each component of this, and then add it all together at the end. Okay. So the first bit is our, sorry, 
are effective irradiated power, okay, our EIRP, which is effectively just the power uh, transmitted times the gain, um, and I've logged it, okay, so I transmitted power. So we were told in the, in the question our transmitted power is 30 watts, okay, so I've just taken 30 watts here, and I've taken the log of it. So our transmitter gain for our parabolic antenna, then I won't need to work out. So I've just worked out this bit here first, the PT 10 log 10. And that's set 14.77 decibels. Now I need to work out the gain, the effect of the gain. Okay? So I know that our transmitter has a beam width of 30 degrees. That was given in the question. Okay? So if I work out what my beam, if I go back, I know it's a parabolic antenna. I find this empirical relationship for the gain of our antenna if I know the beam width. So that's a parameter I've been given, something I know about the antenna, and I know I can work out the gain from that antenna based on the beam width. So I just use this empirical relationship I put in, and I can see the gain is 14.75 decibels for that 30 degree beam width. Any questions around that? Does it generally make sense? So then I just sum these two together. I've got my gain, or my power, transmitted, and my gain. And I just, just take the sum of that, and that gives me my effective irradiated power. Okay, so the power that I had, and then I actually have put it through an antenna. So I made it, I gave it some gain, and this is uh, the effective irradiated power in decibel watts. Okay, so in reference to watts. My receiver gain to noise ratio, again, our gain of our receiver over noise um, is equal to 10 log 10, gain of receiver over, remember our noise temperature is characterized by K, the, step, the Boltzmann constant, times the temperature of the receiver. We were given what the characteristic noise temp temperature was, 135 Kelvin, so I can use that, I can stick that in. Uh, but first of all, I'm going to work out what the gain of my receiver is, so I was told in the question, that is a parabolic antenna with a diameter D, so our receiver, our ground station, with a diameter D of five meters. So I've got a big five meter dish on the ground. I can work out this from this empirical relationship what uh, the gain is. And this relationship requires the diameter of the antenna dish, but it also asks for the frequency. Okay, so we need to know that gain is dependent on the frequency. So we need to know what frequency. <coughs> in the question, we were told it's an S-band antenna with a frequency of 2.12 gigahertz. So I can pop that in to my equation, 2.12, and I can work out that the gain for the receiver, so the receiver is focusing that energy from coming from, focusing the power coming from our transmitter and giving us some further gain, okay? So it's very sensitive. It's like when you have your hand up against your ear, and you can try and hear a little bit more. You're focusing that um, and that sound into your ear. Yeah. Um, when, do we just use gigahertz as like the standard unit? What do we mean by that? Uh, so it, for these empirical relationships, they're, they're, they're determined by gigahertz, or it will tell you if it if it's in hertz. So so <laughs> usually they're they're in terms of gigahertz, but it will tell you what what the frequency. Uh, magnitude needs to be in order to, to put the numbers in. Yeah. So it's a good question, that. Okay, so then we need to work out our noise. So our receiver noise density is um, 10 log 10 times the, the Boltzmann constant, 10 log of the Boltzmann constant, and the log of that um, noise power. So we were told uh, the noise power is 135 Kelvin. We stick that in, and we know what the Boltzmann constant is, is 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23. And so we can work out what the noise is, the noise um, power in decibel hertz. Okay, stick these in. But remember, some of these, it, we're, we look, we're using different units, decibel hertz, decibel watts, but when we did our dimensional analysis, we saw it all works out. Okay, so it doesn't matter if they're slightly different units, when we add them up, because we're not adding them, they're logs, so we're actually multiplying them. 
and it all works out in the dimensional analysis. So if you go back to that slide on dimensional analysis, you can see it, it all makes sense. Then we can work out our receiver gain noise, gain to noise density ratio. Then we work back through for our free space loss equation. So that's the final things we're looking at. Uh, we can work out what our free space loss is based on our, our um, wavelength. A C is the speed of light over the frequency. We can work out what the actual wavelength is if you know the frequency of the signal. Yeah? So we're just going from frequency to wavelength. And we know it's an electromagnetic wave, so it must be traveling at the speed of light. Okay, so that's, that's how we work out the wavelength. And then we can, work, we can calculate through to get what the free space loss is over this, what we call slant range, the range of the signal, so the distance between our transmitter and, or our transmitter of our satellite and our receiver. And we can calculate that through in, in logarithmic, and we get our free space loss in terms of decibels. Okay, so it was a pure ratio, so it's decibel. And we had our additional losses as well. So additional losses, we were told. Um, so these could be anything to do pointing error, line losses. We were told that this was 6.33 in the question. Okay, we said this is 6.33 decibels. Got a few more slides, and then, and then we're finished. So if you, if you bear with me. Uh, have you got another session after this? Is somewhere else to go? Recording stops at 9.55. Recording stops at 9.55, okay. We'll get a few more minutes in. Um, so we, we work out our carry to noise density ratio, and then we can get our link budget. Okay, so this just translates through. I'm just, just taking all of these terms, and I'm adding all of those things that I, that I just, just calculated together. So I'm, the, the gains are positive, and the losses I've subtracted. And I get our carry to noise density ratio um, signal to noise ratio as 106 decibel hertz. I think we're going to have to go in a minute. Okay, so the last few slides are going through, and you can go through these in your own time. The last few slides go through how do I work out my signal to noise in terms of, or my energy per bit to noise ratio. So I, I now, I've now calculated my signal to noise ratio. How do I work out my energy per bit ratio? I need to know my bit rate. Okay. And I pop my bit rate in, that's given in the question, and I can then work out what my energy per bit. So that was the first part of the question. Modulation scheme is the next part. So if you have a look at that slide, you can work out what your bit energy error rate needs to be. And I can look on this graph and I can see what, um, I can take that bit energy ratio and I can see what EB over NO I've got and I can work out what's the best modulation scheme. Okay, so I'm getting um, a mini minimum energy of 10 dB there. So the best modulation scheme is 8 FSK. So I just see that on the chart. And then the final thing is our link margins. We worked out what our EB over NR is, and then we know what our bit error rate is. So we put, uh, subtract our bit error rate from our EB and over and we have to also subtract our implementation losses, and that gives us that margin. Because that margin is, as I said, that, that um, bit we have between um, to, to account for any of the losses that we've not considered. Okay? So what tolerances do we have in our signal to be able to, to, to account for that? Now, I've gone three minutes over, but I hope that that's kind of relatively clear. If you've got any further questions about that, please review the slides and stick them up on Piazza. But we will be going through in tutorial tomorrow these link budgets, the equations. So if you have a review of that for tomorrow's tutorial, that will really help you. OK? Well, I'll see you, see you tomorrow, then.